I am now the most miserable man living. If what I feel were equally distributed to the whole human family, there would not be one cheerful face on the earth. Whether I shall ever be better, I cannot tell. I awfully forebode that I shall not. To remain as I am is impossible. I must die or be better, it appears to me. So wrote Abraham Lincoln in 1841 in a letter to his friend Lincoln, who as a Christian man, was one of the most successful presidents this nation has ever had. One of the greatest preachers since the time of the apostles stood in his, people, his pulpit and told his people this in 1866, I am the subject of depressions of spirit so fearful that I hope none of you ever gets to such extremes of wretchedness as I go to. Or consider these words from another preacher of God's word. You deceived me, Lord, and I was deceived. You overpowered me and prevailed. I'm ridiculed all day long and everybody mocks me. Cursed be the day I was born. May the day my mother bore me not be blessed. Cursed be the man who brought my father the news, who made him very glad, saying, A child is born to you, a son. May that man be like the towns the Lord overthrew without pity. May he hear wailing in the morning, a battle cry at noon, for he did not kill me in the womb with my mother as my grave. Why did I ever come out of the womb to see trouble and sorrow and to the end of my days, to end my days in shame? Well, that was the prophet Jeremiah who spoke those words under the inspiration of God's Spirit and God saw fit to include them in the Scriptures. Christians are not immune to depression. God's people are not somehow insulated from serious seasons and bouts of deep darkness. And yet so often, Christians don't want to admit that we experience depression. One reason I think this is true is from the nature of the Christian faith itself. To be a Christian is to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It is to resolve to live in dependence upon Him. It's to say that His life of complete obedience to God's commandments, His death under the curse of God's commandments in behalf of sinners, and His resurrection have done everything necessary to make me right with God. To be a Christian is to say that because of Jesus, I'm reconciled to God. It's to say my sins are forgiven. God accepts me. God loves me. God has promised to receive me eternally where I will live with him forever. So if that's true of a person, why in the world should that type of person ever be depressed? I mean, if you have Christ, you have everything, right? We sing that. If God's for you, who can be against you, right? The Bible says that. And we know those things to be true. Well, all of those things were true for Lincoln. They were true for Charles Spurgeon. They were true for the prophet Jeremiah, and not only him, but others like the prophets Elijah, Moses, and Jonah. Those things have been true for eminently useful servants of God that we esteem and still learn from today today. People like Martin Luther, Martin Lloyd-Jones, all of whom to various degrees at different times in their lives suffered from depression. Because we know what we should, that we should not be depressed, it's often hard for those who trust Jesus Christ to admit that we are depressed because it feels like failure. It feels like betrayal to the very one we are staking our lives upon. So too often God's people who experience these types of mental, spiritual bouts suffer alone, in isolation, and then by doing so compound the problems that accompany a depressed state of mind. A second reason we hesitate to discuss depression is because it's just sometimes hard to talk about. In his book, The Problem with Pain, C.S. Lewis rightly observes this. He writes, Mental pain is less dramatic than physical pain, but it is more common and also more hard to bear. 
The frequent attempt to conceal mental pain increases the burden. It's easier to say, my tooth is aching, than it is to say, my heart is broken. And yet, Christians are not immune to broken hearts. Because we find it awkward, difficult, or somehow feeling unfaithful to talk about it, many Christians fall into depression and struggle with it in seasons and for lengthy times without ever letting anybody else really know what's going on inside. Yeah, brothers and sisters, what we desperately need is an honest and open assessment about the reality of depression, especially as it exists among God's people, and to see what God has done to provide for His people who suffer for or with depression. As we've already heard from God's Word this morning in Psalm number 13, God's people can experience deep sorrows, brokenheartedness, deep spiritual moral darkness in their minds. The Psalms are filled with testimonies of believers going through such seasons of melancholy. And I commend that book of Psalms to you if you struggle with this or you've ever experienced it or you live with those or know those who do. Today as we continue our study through the book of 2 Corinthians, we're going to see that not even the Apostle Paul was immune to depression. He tells us about his own experience in his own words as he talks about his relationship to the Corinthian church and about the context out of which he writes this letter to them. But he isn't interested merely in talking about or admitting that he suffered with depression. Rather, he talks about it in order to show us how God comforted him through depression. Paul wants us to understand that God knows how to comfort his weary, depressed servants. Our text this morning is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 2 through 16. If you're using one of the Bibles provided for you, that's page 967. Page 967. I'm going to read this whole chapter beginning in the second verse of it, 2 Corinthians 7, verse 2, down through verse 16, which completes this chapter as it's given to us in the Scriptures. So follow along in your copy of God's Word as I read this text for our consideration. Make room in your hearts for us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We've taken advantage of no one. I do not say this to condemn you, for I said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. I'm acting with great boldness toward you. I have great pride in you. I'm filled with comfort. In all our affliction, I'm overflowing with joy. For even when we came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest. But we were afflicted at every turn, fighting without and fear within. But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted by you. As he told us of your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced still more. For even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I see that the letter grieved you, though only for a while. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you. But also what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. So although I wrote to you, it was not for the sake of the one who did the wrong, nor for the sake of the one who suffered the wrong, but in order that your earnestness for us might be revealed to you in the sight of God. Therefore, we are comforted. And besides our own comfort, we rejoiced still more at the joy of Titus because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. For whatever boasts I made to him about you, I was not put to shame. But just as everything we said to you was true, so also our boasting before Titus has proved true. And his affection for you is even greater as he remembers the obedience of you all, how you received him with fear and trembling. And I rejoice because I have complete confidence in you. 
God knows how to comfort his weary, depressed servants. There are two points that I want to call to your attention from these verses that we've just read. The first is why God's servants experience depression. And the second is the means that God employs to deliver his servants out of depression by bringing them comfort. Well, look at verses 2 through 5, the first verses that we read. In here we see that true servants of God expose themselves to depression. It just goes with the territory of signing up to be a servant of the Lord. In verse 2, Paul picks up on an appeal that he began to make back in chapter 6, verses 11, 12, and 13. Let me read those verses, just a few verses above where we started this morning. In 2 Corinthians 6, 11 through 13, he writes this, We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. You're not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections. In return, I speak as to children, widen your hearts also. And then verse 2, he says in chapter 7, make room in your hearts for us. What is Paul saying to the Corinthians? He's appealing to them. He's wanting to assure them that he is for them. And he does it in this second verse, beginning with a threefold denial. He wants to clear the air about perhaps accusations that have been made against him. He says, we've wronged no one. In other words, we haven't treated anybody unjustly. We haven't sinned against anybody in the church at Corinth. He says, we've corrupted no one. In other words, we haven't ruined anyone. We haven't caused anybody's spiritual life to just to be shattered. We've taken advantage of no one. In other words, we haven't used anybody for our own personal gain. We didn't look at you as a means to an end to somehow help ourselves. Now, why would Paul make these three denials specifically? Well, one good reason to consider is that this is possibly the heart of some of the accusations that were being made against him in Corinth. Those false teachers had come in. They'd begun to undermine the confidence that the church had in Paul as their spiritual leader. And Perhaps whispered these things. Look at, look at the mess your life is. Look, look what he said about this guy that he writes about in 1 Corinthians 5 in our Bibles. That he used to be delivered over to the devil. Can you imagine anybody being so harsh? Why Paul's just looking at you asking you to take up an offering because he wants to feather his nest financially. Paul hasn't treated you with justice. It may well be that those are the kinds of charges that these teachers were making against him to the church in Corinth trying to undermine Paul's credibility in their minds. But Paul wants to assure them that he loves them. He's their spiritual father. In verse 3, he says that he's not trying to put them in their place. He says, I don't say this to condemn you. I'm not trying to make you feel bad. That's not what I'm shooting for here. He says, you're in my heart for life and death. Look at that phrase. He said, you're in my heart to die together and to live together. What a phrase. God has put you here. I can't help but love you. In life. And up to and through death. He's not giving up on them. He's committed to them. And committed to the cause of Christ. With them. In verse 4. Paul as a very wise spiritual leader. Recognizing things in them. That God is doing and has done reiterates his belief in them. He says, I believe in you. He makes four affirmations in that verse about them. First, he says he has great boldness toward them. That word that's translated boldness in the ESV has the idea of openness, frankness. In other words, I'm not pulling punches with you. I'm not trying to candy coat this with you. I'm speaking plainly to you. And that's really an affirmation. It's, I believe we have this Relationship that is of such a nature that I can speak to you things that specifically, directly need to be said. He goes on to say that he's proud of them. He has great pride in them. Well, this is a proper kind of pride. Not look at what I've done, but he's proud of what God has done in them. He's encouraged with the work of the Lord among them. We see this in verse 14. If you just drop down there and look at, well, he reveals that he had boasted about them to Titus even. 
Before Titus went with his letter, he says, whatever boasts I made, about, I made to him about you, I was not put to shame. But just as everything we said to, you was, said to you was true, so our boasting before Titus has proved true. Third way he affirms him is he speaks about his own encouragement. He says, I'm filled with comfort. He's writing this letter now after he's heard about the response to the letter that he sent that was severe that Titus took to them. And he says, I am filled with comfort. I'm confident in you. And then he indicates he's even ecstatic with joy over them. Even in affliction. In all our afflictions, he writes, I am overflowing with joy. Now that's interesting, isn't it? We tend to think affliction, joy, as alternatives. You can either experience affliction, or you can be joyful. And yet Paul says, in the midst of affliction, I'm just abounding, overflowing, able to rejoice at the same time. Brothers and sisters, that's possible. And not only is it possible, it's something that we need to learn to cultivate so that when affliction comes, we don't suddenly forget reasons we have to be joyful. In the midst of joy, we don't forget that we still have many reasons to, to mourn and seek the Lord for continued provisions. Well, as a result of his love and devotion to them, he reveals to us what was going on in his heart and mind after he wrote the severe letter to correct them that was delivered by Titus before Titus returned to him. He's waiting. He's not sure how the letter landed on them. Not sure what their response would be. Look at verse 5. He says, For even when we came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were afflicted at every turn, fighting without fear within. Here Paul's picking up on a narrative, a story that he began back in chapter 2, verse 13, when he's describing his travels in relationship to them and how he had intended to come to them, then changed his mind, deeming that not to be wise, decided to write a letter instead, sent that letter by Titus. So back in chapter 2, verse 13, he says, When I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, even though a door was open for me in the Lord, my spirit was not at rest because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I took leave of them and went on to Macedonia. So he had sent Titus with this letter, probably that he wrote from Philippi, and sends it to, or the Second Corinthians he wrote from Philippi, he sends it to the church at Corinth, this severe letter to correct some of the shenanigans that are going on in the church that are beginning to undermine his authority as an apostle and therefore the gospel that he preached as an apostle. And he arranged with Titus to meet him back at Troas after Titus had been to Corinth. He goes to Troas, Titus doesn't show up, and it begins to be fall, and then winter, and Titus can't come by way of the sea anymore. So he goes from Troas to Macedonia, where would be the next logical place for Titus to show up, and he tells us now what was going on inside of him when he went to Macedonia. Do You see the language back in verse 5? He was disturbed. He was disturbed by disruptions in the church at Corinth. He was disappointed that Titus, who had taken this letter and they had agreed to meet back in Troas, had not returned to Troas to meet him as planned. And he became spiritually restless. So he left Troas, even though there was opportunity to preach the gospel there, he was too burdened to do so. And he traveled to Macedonia to wait there for Titus. He tells us he was physically weary. You know, brothers and sisters, sometimes at the very root of spiritual depression is physical weariness. Sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is take a nap. Get rest for your body. Come away. Unplug. Just relax. Paul experienced physical weariness. He said he was afflicted at every turn. One student of this passage has put it this way, he was hounded by trouble in every way. What did that mean? From without, he says, and from within. Fightings without, fear within. Now Paul doesn't give us any details of what constituted his experience such that he described it as fighting without, fear within. But that word fighting means contentions, disputes, arguments. Paul had gone to Macedonia on his second missionary journey. You can read about it in Acts 16 and 17. 
And he had a very fruitful ministry there. He planted churches there, Philippi, Thessalonica. Those churches were in that region. God's word had run. People had been converted. Churches were started and established. They were healthy churches. But now he's back in Macedonia. And he says, I've got these disputations against me. I've got arguments. I've got accusations. And it could well be that there were problems in those churches too where people were beginning to criticize his authority as an apostle. We don't know, but we know that whatever it was, he identified it as fighting without. And then, what is even more severe to experience is fear within, internal fear. What is that? I think we can be more uh, confident of what he's speaking about here. He's not afraid for himself. I and mean, Paul was as bold as a lion. He didn't care if he lived or died. He demonstrated that time and again. He taught that. I don't think this is Paul's fear about his own life. I think he's, his fear stemmed from his concern over the church at Corinth. He explicitly states that in the 11th chapter of this letter, verses 28 and 29. And no doubt as he sent that letter by the hand of Titus, a letter in which he had just very pointedly corrected them. We don't have that letter in our New Testaments. We just know about it because of what he says here. I'm sure there were thoughts in his mind. How are they going to receive that? Are they just going to write me off? Is this going to be the, the end of our relationship? Is this going to be the straw that breaks the camel's back? They've already been stirred up against me. And are they going to receive this letter in a way different than what I intended it to be received? Will they reject me completely? Those kinds of concerns for churches... Go with the territory of being a spiritual leader in a church. Paul reveals this very specifically to us in some of his other letters to churches. In Galatians chapter 4 verse 11 he says, I am afraid that I may have labored over you in vain. These are churches throughout the region of Galatia. And Paul's hearing about things going on. He says, have I just wasted my life with these people? He writes to the church at Thessalonica very similarly in 1 Thessalonians 3.5. He says, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. If you're going to serve the Lord and become concerned about the people of God and the things of God, the church of God, you need to be prepared to enter into these kinds of concerns. These kinds of heavy, weighty, burdens about the spiritual welfare of the people that you care about. John Newton, who we <clears throat> know today primarily as a, a great hymn writer, wrote Amazing Grace and uh, other wonderful hymns we sing, was also a pastor and he understood pastors. And, and he wrote one time a, a poem designed perhaps to be a hymn called A Minister's Burden. He understands this very well. Listen to what he writes. Listen to what he writes. What contradictions meet in ministers' employ? It is a bittersweet, a sorrow full of joy. No other post affords a place for equal honor or disgrace. Who can describe the pain which faithful preachers feel when constrained to speak in vain to hearts as hard as steel? Or who can tell the pleasures felt when stubborn hearts begin to melt? The Savior's dying love, the soul's amazing worth, their utmost efforts move and draw their bowels forth. They pray and strive, the rest departs till Christ be formed in sinners' hearts. If some small hope appears, they still are not content. But with a jealous fear, they watch for the event. Too oft they find their hopes deceived and then how their inmost souls are grieved. But when their pains succeed and from the tender blade the ripening ears proceed, their toils are overpaid. No harvest joy can equal theirs to find the fruit of all their cares. And then he ends with this prayer. On what has now been sown, thy blessing, Lord, bestow. The power is thine alone to make it spring and grow. Do thou the gracious harvest raise, and thou alone shalt have the praise. That must have been some of what the Apostle Paul was experiencing in his relationship with the Corinthians. He loved them. He cared about them. He was for them. He wanted to affirm them. 
He believed in them. He saw God's grace in them. And yet, he wasn't sure exactly how all of this was going to work out. He tried his best to write a letter that would address the problems and correct them. He prayed, no doubt, that they would receive that letter in the spirit in which it was written. And yet now Titus has not returned with word of how it landed. By writing the way that he does in verses 2 through 5, Paul is showing us his pastoral heart. He genuinely loves the members of the church at Corinth. He cares about what happens to them. Even though they have re- they've treated him very poorly, he refuses to let that cause him to put up emotional walls against them. He loves them. Because of that, he makes himself emotionally vulnerable. And he has been deeply hurt by them. You know, when you genuinely love somebody, you are by that opening yourself up to be heartbroken. I mean, that's why we grieve when something difficult, painful happens to the one we love. That's why our hearts are broken whenever somebody we love is taken away from us. That's why we weep when somebody we love we see going down a wrong path. That's simply the price that has to be paid for love. If you're going to love, you're going to grieve. You want to stop being hurt by people? I can tell you how to do it. Stop caring. Stop loving. Close your heart off. Put emotional walls up so that you don't let what happens to them affect you. Become an emotional hermit. You won't be grieved by people anymore. But of course, you can't do that. You can't live that way and be a true servant of the Lord. In fact, you can't live like that and be a true Christian. Listen to what Jesus says to his followers in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I've loved you. Also, you are to love one another. By this will all people know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. Okay. How has Jesus loved us? What did Jesus keep back from us that we needed? Jesus loved us by coming to be be one of us, choosing to lay down his life under the judgment of God against sinners, choosing to experience God's wrath against our sin in order to reconcile all who would trust in him to God. Jesus loved us to death. And he says, as I have loved you, you're to love one another. So you see, you can't really be a disciple of Jesus and say, well, I'm going to keep my emotions just really reined in here and I'm not going to let myself care and love to the degree that what happens to you can wound me and hurt me. The Apostle John reiterates the teaching of Jesus here in 1 John chapter 4. Beginning in verse 11, listen to what the apostle of Jesus writes here. He says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not know God, anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we've loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Brothers and sisters, God has loved us so deeply, so wonderfully, so well, so savingly, that the only way that we can keep from loving others is by intentionally sinning and rebelling against God and saying, I'm just not going to live this way. I refuse to live this way. And if you go on living without loving, and you think you've figured out a way to do that and stay Christian, you're deceived. You cannot be a Christian and go on living without love. Because, as I just read, 
Anyone who does not love does not know God. Because God is love. So grief, sorrow, heartbrokenness when your beloved is wounded or goes astray or is taken away is simply the price we pay for loving. Before revealing the nature and the depth of his sorrow and depression that he experienced, Paul lays out for us the reason that he experienced it. He, he lets us in on how it is that what happened in Corinth could affect him back in, in Macedonia. How their actions and reactions could impact him emotionally. And the reason is, he loved them. He cared about them. He was concerned about their wel welfare. Well, true servants of God expose themselves to depression because they love. That's the first thing I want us to see. The second is this, that God comforts His servants through His servants. God comforts His people through people. Look at verse 6. Paul starts describing how he received comfort. He starts with these two great words, but God. But God. I think those are probably the most important words in the Bible. They're certainly the most hope-filled words in the Bible. Paul was discouraged, despondent, downcast. But God. The Corinthian church was in disarray. It might fall apart. But God. People were opposing Paul in Macedonia. But God. You see, no matter how desperate your situation is, even when everything seems lost, even when you reach a point when in reality there is no hope, there's always this. But God can change it in a moment. So when you find yourself in what seems to be an impossible situation, when you find yourself in a place in life emotionally, spiritually, when the heavens seem like they're brass, your prayers just bounce back on your head. It seems like nothing is ever going to be right or good again. Remember these two words in the Bible, but God. God can intervene. God has intervened. God will intervene. And when He does, everything changes in a moment. But God who comforts the downcast, Paul writes, comforted Paul. God did it. Paul was very clear on how comfort came to his downtrodden, downcast soul. But God used means to accomplish it. He used people. He comforts his servants through his servants. Look at verse 6 again. He did it through Titus. Through Titus. Now what did Titus do? He showed up. <laughs> he just showed up. You know, Woody Allen has famously said that 80% of success is just showing up. Doesn't seem like much, does it? Just getting there. Just making an appearance. I think we underestimate the power of being there. The power of presence. Sometimes when a brother or sister is struggling or suffering, have you ever found yourself wishing you knew what to say? Have you ever found yourself just tongue-tied and emotionally tied in knots because you think, oh, they need help. I don't know how to help them. I'm afraid I might say the wrong thing. Well, the best thing in the world might be for you to say nothing and just go. Hug them. Weep with them. Pray for them. Just show up. Just be there. That's what God used to comfort Paul. You know, one of the worst things you can do when you are discouraged, downcast, depressed, is to isolate yourself. To cut yourself off from people. Yet, isn't that an incredible temptation? I mean, here we see it again. It's elsewhere in the Scriptures, but here we see it in this passage. God comforts His people through people. Yet what happens whenever you begin to feel down? You begin to 
find yourself emotionally going into a dark place, what happens? Sunday comes along. And you know where your commitments are. You know where your provisions are. You know what God has said. And yet you think it would just be horrible to be around people. I just can't stand the thought of being around people. I feel so miserable. What's going on there? You're cutting yourself off from the very means that God uses to comfort His downcast people. Showing up, being around God's people is a means that God uses to comfort His people. Paul says that he was comforted not only by Titus' presence, but by also by the encouragement that Titus himself felt. Look at verse 7. He says, it's not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted by you. As he told us of your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced still more. And then in verse 13, he returns to this. In the middle of that verse, he says, and besides our own comfort, we rejoiced still more at the joy of Titus because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. The Corinthians' positive response to correction and their positive response to Titus caused Titus to rejoice and Titus' joy caused Paul to be comforted. Look at verse 15. He says, Titus' affections for you are even greater as he remembers the obedience of you all, how you received him with fear and trembling. Brothers and sisters, when you're able to see God's grace at work in other people, believers, you have the opportunity not only to be encouraged yourself by that, but to become a source of encouragement for others. How? By sharing it. By helping other people to see it. Helping the person himself or herself see it. When you see grace operating in their lives that maybe they're not consciously aware of. Look for evidences of grace at work in your fellow Christians' lives. Point it out. Commend it. Where it is appropriate, celebrate it. Rejoice over it with others. Paul was comforted by Titus. He was also comforted by God as God used the Corinthians. Paul had written his severe letter to them to rebuke and correct them, and he knew that it would hurt them. But he loved them too much not to speak the truth to them. He wanted to see them rescued from the wrong ways that they were headed. He wanted to see the false leadership exposed, which was trying to take them astray. His hope was that the grief that he knew his letter would cause them would lead them to repentance. And that's exactly what happened. Look at verses 8 through 10. He says, For even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it. You understand what he's saying. I mean, look at the outcome. I'd do it again. But in the moment, knowing how it was going to land on you, there was a part of me that really regretted you going through that emotional experience. For I see the letter grieved you, though only for a while. As it is, I rejoice not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. Isn't that a great statement? Grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Whereas worldly grief produces death. What is Paul telling us about the grief that the Corinthians experienced as a result of his writing this letter and they're receiving it? One thing he's telling us is that they grieved, but it was not in a worldly way. The grief that was produced by his letter was not a worldly grief that he says produces death at the end of verse 10. Now, it's important reading these verses. It's important for us to realize there are two types of grief that we can experience in this life. Worldly grief, godly grief. But what makes it complicated is that very often on the surface, they look and can even act alike to a degree. They can sound alike. But worldly grief leads to death. And it leads to death because it does not focus on what your actions mean to God, but focuses only on what the consequence of your actions means for you. 
And so everything terminates on you. Esau in the Old Testament is a classic example of worldly grief. You can go back and read his story in Genesis chapters 25, 26, and 27. There we read how as the firstborn son of Isaac, one day he comes in from the field and he's hungry and his younger brother is cooking stew. And he says, give me some stew. And they work out a trade. His birthright is the firstborn for a bowl of stew. And then later, when his father Isaac gives the blessing of the firstborn to his younger brother, he's grieved. Esau's grieved. Listen to what the text says. Esau cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry. He said to his father, Bless me, even me also, O oh my father. He wept bitter tears of grief. Real heartbrokenness. But his grief, deep as it was, was worldly grief. He lost his blessing. He was grieved over that. He wasn't grieved that he'd sinned against God in the ways of God by selling his birthright. His grief terminated on himself. It was worldly grief. Now contrast that to the grief that King David felt. After David, a man after God's own heart, committed adultery and then lied and deceived people to cover up his adulterous relationship with Bathsheba to the point of having her husband in essence murdered in battle so that he could get away with it. And when God sent the prophet Nathan to David and said to him, David, you are the man. You have sinned against God. David grieved. He grieved deeply. But listen to the way David expressed his grief. It's in Psalm number 51. Have mercy on me, O God. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. David's not saying, oh, What's going to happen to my kingdom? What's going to be my reputation? How's history going to remember me? It's God, I've sinned against you. And then he makes this statement. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight so that you may be justified and held blameless in your judgment. Do you see the difference? David, confronted with his sin, is broken before God. He says, I can't believe... I've sinned against my God this way. He's been so good to me. He doesn't deserve this. He's been nothing but merciful to me. And I have shattered his commandments. It's godly grief. Godly grief that led to repentance. A change to David. Compared to worldly grief. That caused Esau to weep bitter tears over what he had lost. And how he would suffer as a result. The grief of the Corinthians was godly. It led to repentance. They were grieved into repenting, that verse 9 says. Verse 10 says, Godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. This is what the work of the Spirit results in in a person's life. Hating sin, turning from sin, looking to God for forgiveness and recognizing that every sin, no matter how slight it might appear, no matter how easily it is covered up, every sin is against our good and gracious God who gave up His Son for us. When we see it rightly, we weep over it, not because of the consequences that come to us, though they might be dire, but because we have sinned against our God. And we turn away from that sin because we know it dishonors and displeases Him. I wonder if you've ever experienced this kind of grief. Do you know what it is not just to be sorry for the implications of your sin? Do you know what it is to stand before God and to Recognize that you have sinned against the God who gave you life. The God who gives you breath. The God who keeps your heart pumping. 
The God who's revealed His Son to you. The God who's given you His Word. The God who calls you to trust Him, to believe Him, to follow Him. Have you ever seen yourself as a sinner before this God and been brought to a point of godly grief where you say, Oh God, I've sinned against You. Have mercy on me. Wash me. Cleanse me. Change me. Save me. Friend, if you've never experienced that kind of grief, my prayer for you today is that now, right now, through this word, as the Spirit helps you to see it, opens your eyes, that you will come to recognize that you have sinned against your God. And that you'll look to Him for mercy and forgiveness. Because He delights in showing mercy and forgiveness to sinners. That's what He did with David. That's what He did with the Corinthians. That's what He will do for you. If you confess your sin and repent of your sin and turn away from living as someone who does not care about the commandments of the God who has made you, provided for you, rules over you. Trust Him. Come to Him. Believe Jesus. That's why Jesus died. So that sinners like you and me might be forgiven of our sins. Well, the grief of the Corinthians was demonstrated to be a godly grief through the repentance that it produced. And in verse 11, what we have is the most concise, the most wonderful description of repentance anywhere in the Bible. If you want to know what it means to repent, you want to know what true repentance is, what it looks like, then look at 2 Corinthians 7, 11. Here Paul gives to us seven characteristics of true repentance that result from godly grief. Let me just walk through them quickly with you. He says, I know your grief was godly because what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you. What he means by that is you have rejected apathy and indifference that has let you just go on in this state of being led astray, led to to dismiss the authority of Jesus Christ through his apostle, and now you're determined to live seriously in the Lord. What eagerness to clear yourselves. Previously, they have been led to stand against Paul, or at least to allow Paul's authority in the church to be undermined. They just sat by passively. Now they're trying to clear this. They're trying to make things right. What indignation. Indignation against the ones who led them astray. Indignation against themselves for being led astray. What fear. Not of Paul. Of God. Realizing we have sinned against God. We've done this to our God. What longing, longing for Paul to make things right with Paul. What zeal, determination, not just to see it happen in time, but right now, urgency. We want things restored the way they ought to be. And then what punishment, probably a reference to discipline against those who have stood and led the charge against the Apostle Paul. Paul concludes his list by adding, at every point, you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. He doesn't even bring it up, just the matter. The matter. How kind. And yet, he sees their lives overflowing with godly sorrow that is leading to true repentance. This obvious display of repentance on the part of the Corinthians warmed Paul's heart. That was his goal in writing. That's what he wanted to see. Look at the way he puts it in verses 12. Beginning in verse 13, he says, So although I wrote to you, it was not for the sake of the one who did the wrong, nor for the sake of the one who suffered the wrong. That would be him. But in order that your earnestness for us might be revealed to you in the sight of God, therefore we are comforted. Why? Because that earnestness was revealed in the sight of God. His main concern wasn't to put people in their place. His main concern wasn't to vindicate himself. His main concern was to encourage the restoration of the relationship that he had with the church before God. And although he had spent months in deep grief and sorrow and concern about how this might turn out, now his sorrow, his depression has been lifted by the presence of Titus and by the repentance of the Corinthians. Well, Paul concludes this section of his letter with a very pivotal statement in verse 16. It pivots for the rest of the letter. He says, I rejoice because I have complete confidence in you. Why? How can Paul say this about this church? He has confidence in them, not because he thinks they're so strong, so wise, so good. 
He has confidence in them because he sees God's grace at work. That's why their sorrow was godly. That's why they are now bearing fruits of repentance. So he's confident in God's work in them to will and to do what is right. And he demonstrates this confidence in the rest of the letter. The next two chapters, specifically in chapters 8 and 9, when he gets very personal and very practical with them about how they give away their money. Confident. The grace of God is in you so that when you hear the instructions of God, you will order your finances accordingly. So Paul goes from sorrow to joy. From uncertainty to confidence. From depression to comfort. He experiences this because God knows how to lift up his servants when they are downcast. And if you're going to be serious about serving the Lord in any capacity, if you're going to be more than just somebody who wants to hang on or identify as a Christian, if you're going to be all in in following Jesus Christ, then you can be sure that you will have ample opportunity to be downcast because of your devotion to Christ and his people. But brothers and sisters, Don't let that deter you and don't you believe for one second that God is going to be satisfied to leave you there. He knows how to comfort his weary, depressed servants. And he does it by causing his grace to work in other people, bringing them into your lives to comfort you, to remind you of things that are true, to point out evidences of his grace at work that you might otherwise not see. What this means, brothers and sisters, is that God is going to comfort others through you. You are going to be a tool of his means of comforting brothers and sisters that at some point in their lives will be downcast. What it also means is that if you are going through one of those dark tunnels right now, get with God's people. Open up yourself to a true Christian and seek the comfort and fellowship that God gives through his people. Because he's a God of all comfort. He's a God who delights in caring for those who are with him, seeking to honor him in the way that they live their lives among his people. And he will do that by comforting the downcast. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you that you have revealed this to us in Scripture. Thank you for the way that you caused Paul to be open about his own afflictions and sorrows of heart. Thank you for comforting him through the coming of Titus and through the repentance of the Corinthians. Help us to recognize that when we live by repentance and faith, we can become a source of comfort to other believers. When we simply show up, to be present with those that are brokenhearted. You can use us to comfort other people. Lord, I pray for people here today that know nothing of this kind of comfort. Would you not speak and open their eyes to see what you have done for us in Jesus Christ and glorify yourself by revealing Christ in them. We pray in his name.